Thank you, Donald, and good evening, everybody. So we learn today that Sally Jones, the British jihadist... This is the woman who was an ISIS recruit. This is the woman who was an ISIS recruiter, a former punk rocker from Kent, who fled to Syria with her one son back in 2013. Uh, and you may have seen pictures of her online, a rabid, dangerous jihadist. We learn today that she's been killed in a US strike. Drone strike, missile strike, I'm not entirely sure, but she's been killed. Uh, the British government have said that any British people out in Syria, and this was as she was trying to leave Raqqa, uh, are legitimate targets. Uh, and indeed, the British government does have a bit of history of this. It's worth thinking about this, because David Cameron actually ordered some drone strikes that killed two British citizens going back to 2015. Uh, Rayard Khan, a 21-year-old from Cardiff, who was an ISIS recruiter, was killed by a British missile, as indeed was Rahul Amin, who was 26 years old. So, overall, there were three British citizens, two killed by UK airstrikes, one killed by US airstrikes. So we've shown in recent times no particular compunction uh, to take out British citizens fighting on the side of ISIS over in Syria. And I guess that principle could apply elsewhere too. But Mr Corbyn, leader of the Labour Party, and of course pretty much a lifelong pacifist, was asked on ITV earlier today what he would do in, in, in dealing with these kind of people if he was the Prime Minister. Here he is. Presumably you would rather Sally Jones was put on trial. I think people that have committed crimes ought to be put on trial and that way of course when you interrogate somebody you get more information about the background to it because uh, I represent a constituency that lost many people in 7-7 and we remember what happened that day. Uh, would you have given the order to kill Sally Jones in a drone strike to prevent British armed forces being put unnecessarily in harm's way? I think it's difficult to give an answer to that question which is hypothetical. I think we have to look at very carefully uh, the effects on the civilian population of any bombing that takes place before such a decision is made, but you have to look at all the facts of it. Well, of course, the hypothetical question comes up again, as indeed uh, Ian Dale was accused of asking a hypothetical question earlier this week when he asked the Prime Minister how she would vote, remain or leave in an EU referendum today. But what is pretty clear uh, is that Mr Corbyn's notion that somehow a jihadist fighting out in Raqqa in Syria could be put on trial in this country. Frankly, that ain't going to happen. And I think he's pretty reluctant, isn't he, to say that order strikes that would lead to the death of British citizens, as indeed in the past, he was very reluctant to support the police in a policy of shoot to kill on the streets if they were dealing with suspected terrorists. So I want to ask you a simple question. Having heard what Corbyn has said today, is this the response you want from a potential future Prime Minister? And if you think there's no problem with anything Jeremy Corbyn has said, then please call me on 0345 6060 If you think it's weak-kneed and we need somebody who's got to have a bit more guts, then of course text to 84850. Maybe you think journalists are asking too many hypothetical questions, in which case you can tweet on at LBC using the hashtag Farage at LBC, and you can watch me on Facebook. I'm live here this evening from New York City. I'm going to get a Phil in Wolverhampton. Phil, do you think Jeremy Corbyn's response is the right, principled one, or frankly unacceptable given the world we're living in? It's entirely unacceptable considering the world we're living in, Nigel, and hello and good evening. And, good evening. And it's lovely to, it's lovely to speak to you, sir. Uh, right, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, I'm, I'm afraid that kind of response is not the response I would expect to hear from somebody who potentially could be put in charge of the safety of our society and our country. The naivety of people I've heard calling LBC today, as, as, and again, the naivety of Mr Corbyn, they seem to live in some sort of strange idealistic world where they do not deal with the actualities of what is going on. Now, I am very sorry to learn or to hear that there's a possibility of a 12-year-old child dying with yes. the mother. But, yes. but, what a lot of people are confusing. A lot of people are hearing 12-year-old child and thinking of a little boy standing by the pick-and-mix counter at Woolworths. We're, we're not. We're hearing about somebody who has been brought up 
in this dreadful ideological m- medieval type of mindset that is dead set against the destruction of Western society. And I'm very sorry that that child died, but that child died as a result of its mother's choices many years ago. And with, as long as we have got people in this country who are able to use the forces and the technology that we have to degrade those forces and those fighters out there without the loss of our own troops, then so be it. I'm sorry, but I will fully support anybody who is prepared to prevent a Manchester, who is prepared to prevent a 7-7, just yeah. by using technology. I mean, I mean, the point about the 12-year-old son possibly being dead, this has not been confirmed, by the way, no. possibly, or perhaps even probably uh, being dead, is a point that has been raised by Amnesty International, um, and you yeah. would expect them to do so. But, uh, yeah, listen, it's not the 12-year-old's fault that his mother uh, took him to live in Raqqa when he was eight years old, and I understand that. So, to you, uh, to you, Phil, uh, the government's position, and indeed David Cameron's previous strikes that killed British citizens in that war zone, that to you is wholly acceptable. Totally, if it degrades Daesh's capability to harm our society. Fine, OK. No, Phil, listen, you're very clear. Um, Martin says, if we don't bomb IS just because there's a kid there, then they will use this against us. Well, one thing for certain, Martin, if they were attacking us, uh, they wouldn't be worried about kids being there. In fact, you could argue, in the case of Manchester, they actually willfully targeted young girls who were there attending that concert. Ian, is a new caller from Bury St Edmunds. Ian, good evening. Hello, oh, Nigel. Absolute pleasure. Yeah, but now, would you expect the leader of Her Majesty's Opposition, and perhaps the next Prime Minister, to be a bit tougher on this, or is he raising some very principal concerns? Well, judging on Corbyn's previous history, I can't say I'm surprised, um, but at the same time, it certainly is unacceptable to say that we could potentially have a leader who basically would be too afraid or inhibited to act on our behalf and attack an enemy that completely despises us to our core and the, the, the topic all day I've been listening to is about rehabilitation this we should send troops in there and to be honest the gentleman before has completely stolen my thunder because he's pretty much okay. everything I was going to say um, yeah. but the, the, the option the, the, are they the, the, the whole reason these surgical strikes exist they actually limit damage because sending troops in would there'd be losses on our side and there'd also be even more deaths over there as well. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, Ian, to Jeremy Corbyn, he did say, you know, that, 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 he, that we should look at the effects on a civilian population before we bomb, and that everything should be looked at on a case-by-case basis. So Corbyn did say that. Um, but overall, you're, overall, I think, Ian, the impression that he gives is this is not, this is not action that he would ever actually sanction, is it? No, absolutely not. And he's, he's made he's he's made this point before also for how he wouldn't be willing to act if necessary, and just take into account the fact that this woman is out there without her dying. Whenever it, a few months ago, there'd be a lot more deaths on our side. I'm absolutely certain of it. No, OK. No, Ian, perfectly clear. Thank you. And in defence of Jeremy Corbyn, Dave says to me by text, he says, I would hope anyone with the power to order a drone strike would take every decision on a case-by-case basis with reference to all the facts, including listening to the pros and cons. Corbyn is therefore absolutely right. There can never be a generic answer to your question, assuming somebody hasn't spent the last 24 hours being fully briefed by the military. Well, Dave, fine, but uh, sometimes in government you have to make decisions and you can't necessarily necessarily spent hour and hour and hours over each individual decision. Marek on Facebook thinks differently and says, logic would suggest if people want to kill you, you kill them first. I wonder what Brian, who's calling from Farningham, thinks. Brian, good evening. Hello, yes. Um, well, I think uh, Jeremy Corbyn's stance is, <laughs> is a bit, you know, silly. But in theory, if you, if you capture somebody... You uh-huh. can get more information from them, right? Yes, But yes. in reality, trying to capture that person is more difficult than it sounds. It's not yeah. a video game. 
No, I mean, I, I mean, Brian, again, again, and I'm, I am trying to be fair to Jeremy Corbyn over this, Corbyn did make the point that if you capture somebody, you put them on trial, you will get more information. So that point you've made is, is, is absolutely valid. But how on earth do you get somebody from Raqqa back to a court in the United Kingdom? That's the problem, isn't it? So, yeah. the, I mean, the best solution is to kill them. Is to kill them. However, like, my, my issue isn't whether or not it's right to kill them. It's whether or not we're actually making a difference. For the past 5, 10, 15 years, we've been hearing that uh, we've killed the leader of, you know, al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, al-Qaeda in Yemen, al-Qaeda in Syria, and... Every every year, you know, the terrorist groups just get more vicious and vicious. Like, that's my issue. Are we really making a big difference? Wow. Well, I think, Brian, the, the, the problem is you can kill, uh, you know, ISIS leaders and people say, isn't it great? And you can drive them out of Raqqa and people say, that's more, you know, that's absolutely wonderful. Uh, the truth is that ISIS is an ideology. It's a multi-headed hydra. It exists in many parts all over the world. And actually, Brian... If we really, really, really wanted to be ISIS, we would have to take them on simultaneously in a whole number of countries at once. And I suspect, Brian, to do this and win, we would need to use not our boots on the ground, not American boots on the ground, but that of the local populations, governments and armies. So, I, Brian, I'm with you. Uh, it, it, you know, it sounds great. We're killing leaders of ISIS. It's all going to be wonderful, but it never really amounts... It never really amounts to very much. Uh, do you... Brian, let me just ask you quickly. How big a right. threat... How big a threat to our way of life do you think radical jihadi extremism is? Um... <laughs> It's 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 a threat, but I don't I don't see it as a threat that it's literally going to take over every single aspect of our lives. It's a threat in the sense that it's a threat to people's lives. Yeah, but yeah. not literally going to take over our our entire system, like laws, how we do things. It's not going to get to that. It's not going to get get to that level. Well, I. You know? Everybody I don't listening think so personally, but, I, ev but everybody listening to this, Brian, will hope you're right in that. They really will, and thank you, Brian. Another first-time caller from Farningham in Kent. You're listening to the Nigel Farage show. As we learn that Sally Jones, the white widow, British jihadist, has been killed by a U.S. strike in Syria, and Jeremy Corbyn basically says that unless he had all the facts and he preferred it to have got her back uh, to the U.K. on trial, that he would not order such a strike. I'm asking you: Is this the kind of response you want from? a potential future leader. A couple of things to think about in this debate. The first one is, it's all well and good the government saying these people are, le are legitimate targets, and as I said to you earlier, David Cameron directly ordering strikes that have, caught, that have killed British passport holders fighting for IS over in Syria, and yet... When it comes to the call, the plea, uh, and I've been somebody saying this for years, that we should ban anyone from coming back into our country who's fought for ISIS, an estimated 400 people who were fought over there, been further radicalised and brutalised by war, have come back to the United Kingdom, and so far, we've only stopped one person from coming back in. So it's OK to bomb them and kill them when they're out there in Syria, but equally, it's fine to let them back into the United Kingdom. Something wrong there, I suggest. Also, interestingly... Uh, the Conservative government, the last one, this one, um, are perfectly happy to kill British citizens out in Syria. Yet, of course, we'd never, ever, ever use the death penalty for anybody here in this country. So only one British jihadist has been banned from coming back into the UK. Uh, and, and remember, who was the Home Secretary for nearly all of this period? You've got it. Teresa, the hypothetical. Adam from Ladbroke Grove is calling me. Adam, good evening. Hi, Nigel. How are you? I'm fine. Do you think Corbyn is right on this on moral grounds, or do we need, when it comes to dealing with the war against jihadism, to forget the rules and start killing people? I think, um, I think the Labour leader uh, expresses a very valid point in that, as Brits and as British people... We ha adhere to certain values. If we go around killing everyone abroad, uh, whether they be citizen or not, uh, you know, we're the same as they are, in a way. So what Jeremy Corbyn is saying, in my honest view, is true. And he's right to do so. But he is, Adam, he is, Adam, through 
and and actually, I mean, to be fair, through conviction, uh, Corbyn is a pacifist, isn't he? No, but it's not about being a pacifist. You try and label him as a pacifist, this, as that. In all honesty, it's not about pacifism. It's about these are our ideals. This is what we stand for. We don't stand for murdering and bombing other people. We stand for the, the, the rule of law. And, and, and we're going to adhere to these principles. And that is what separates us from savages. That's what okay. it comes down to at the end of the day. Okay, if, if, I, if I was to broaden this out, Adam, and to say to you, are you happy that UK strikes, and take the individuals, take the British passports out of it, take targeting out of it, are you happy in principle for UK forces to kill ISIS fighters in Syria or elsewhere? To be honest with you, um, if the government of that country invites British soldiers to come on and assist them, they have every right to be there and to fight ISIS and to kill them. That's not the issue. But the issue here is we're not going to go out to a country randomly bombing people, even though we've never been requested to. We're going to stick by our principles. And it, it, the, the thing is, if you don't stick by your principles, you're as bad as these people are. They mm. come to London uh, killing innocent people and bombing them or they go to Paris or, or Germany. If we do the same in Syria, we're the same as they are. Okay. We have to be a, a beacon of light to these people. Do you understand? Um, Adam, you've made your point very, very clearly indeed. And I thank you. Um, the 12-year-old, the business of the child that may have been killed with Sally Jones is, is getting a lot of you talking. Um, his mother was his guardian and chose to take him along. She got him killed, says Lydia. Colin raises uh, a moral question. He says, uh, will you answer the hypothetical question whether you would drop a bomb on a 12-year-old child because of the alleged crimes of his mother? Well, Colin, I think the real answer to that is that if you go to war, wherever you go to war, and if you drop bombs of any kind, and, and you can talk about smart bombs, and you can talk about accuracy, the truth is that if you go to war in any way, you will always have collateral damage, and that means children and innocent people do get killed. It's one of the reasons why I, over the last 15, 20 years, uh, have been so reluctant for us to go to war again and again. Going to war ought to be the last resort. Too often in the last 20 years, it's been almost the first choice of British governments. That's certainly my feeling. Uh, Josh in Tooting, who's a new caller of the show. Good evening, Josh. Hi, Nigel. So, is Corbyn right to be principled about this, or is he living in a sort of ridiculous, unrealistic land when we're fighting against this savagery of ISIS? No, I think he's, he's right to assess it case by case. Um, I think that the, the way things have gone, um, we, we've got a Tory leadership in and kind of Tory um, Tory supporters now have, have kind of just made themselves look very, very heartless. They're, um, they're supporting the fact that a 12-year-old has been killed. Now, the way they have to look at this is if, for instance, um, their wife decided to leave and, and run away to Syria and take one of their children um, and three years goes past and they, they have no contact, they have no, no way of getting across to that person would they still then support the fact that they're going to kill their 12 year old son i don't think it i don't uh, think so. well they wouldn't josh unless they thought that the unfortunate collateral damage of a 12 year old getting killed might have stopped a woman in the case of sally jones who was fleeing raqqa because isis of course were being defeated in that city i mean supposing sally jones josh was on yeah. her way was on her way back to the united kingdom with the intent of planning a Manchester-style attack. Uh, I, yeah. guess in, I guess in those circumstances, even though it does mean the death of a 12-year-old child, in those circumstances, a bit tough for the British government not to do it, isn't it? Well, I think, I think that would mean the British government has failed us, because if she can get back into the country, there's yeah. a problem there. From, well, there from, is, no, from I, there. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I um, that's a very loud motorbike there going past. No, Josh, I agree with that. And actually, actually, it is hypocritical of this government to talk the way they do when they've allowed nearly 400 ISIS fighters back into Britain, every one of them potentially dangerous, and stopped only one. So uh, maybe securing our own borders, Josh, would be a better first priority. I don't even think it's about securing the borders. But 
that's that's not the problem. The problem, I think the real deep root of the problem is that effectively a lot of people in this country are celebrating the fact that we've killed a 12-year-old. Mm, I think that's I don't, the way you have to look well, at it. Well, Josh, I think you're exaggerating there. I don't think anyone is celebrating the fact a 12-year-old has been killed. Not anybody is celebrating it, but there are some celebrating the fact that this white widow is no longer with us. Josh from Tooting, I thank you very much. Christine thinks on Facebook that the younger ones, uh, until, until around the age of 20, people don't understand their reasons, actions or consequences. No, Christine, they don't, but in this case, uh, it wasn't for the 12-year-old to understand it. It was his mother that put him directly in harm's way. David says, I've no sympathy for anyone who decides to go to ISIS and gets killed apart from the innocent children. Yes, they are innocent children. Um, I believe she got what she deserves, says Andrew. She effectively renounced her British citizenship and I believe that the UK no longer had any moral responsibility towards her. Andrew, my suggestion four years ago on this was that what we did was to take away the passports from people who'd been to fight for ISIS. Uh, and I was told, no, 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 you can't do that because that would make people stateless and to which i said no actually they chosen their state it was called islamic state sean is calling from slough sean good evening good evening nigel so what would you expect would you i mean let's just say corbyn does become the pm which <laughs> on the current trajectory of mrs may yeah. is not is not totally impossible i mean <laughs> would would you expect a british prime minister uh, to take tough decisions such as such as being prepared to sanction strikes that would kill British citizens? Well, that's quite a, a meta question, I think. But It is, let's, yeah. But let's, let's boil it down. Um, I've been reading through the Facebook comments, and I think we keep seeing this theme of, uh, which you've touched on previously, of you know the realities of, of this world and the ideals which we supposedly base our society on. Yeah. And we can't... You know, I think what a lot of people take issue with is when we drone strike these people and kill civilians, there isn't really any accountability. I think what Corbyn says overall is, is extremely admirable, which is that we should try and expend all the other options first, you know, putting them, capturing them, putting them, putting them on trial, getting the local forces to capture these people and maybe putting them on trial locally. But, rehabilitating them and doing all of these things. But Sean, but Sean, but Sean, the local forces are fighting these people to the death. That is true, but if we have any leverage that we have, should be used to try maybe to try maybe de-escalate the current situation. Because what has the situation stands, as everyone has said, we live in quite a dangerous world. And the threat of extremism since our intervention, since our bombing campaigns throughout the Middle East, hasn't really gone down, has it? So whatever we're doing, I don't think it's really working. It's, we are killing far too many civilians in the process and just creating more extremists rather than less. I think the argument, Sean, that in Iraq, uh, in that campaign, that we killed a huge number of civilians, uh, which probably led to increased numbers of radicalised people in Britain and elsewhere. Sean, I think your point is unarguable, which is why I've always found it very difficult then and now to support the aims and intentions of the Iraq war and David and, 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 and Blair being fully behind George Bush. And then we saw Cameron attempting the same thing in Libya. We've got a lot wrong in the past. Of that, I have no doubt. I thank you, Sean, very much indeed. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show. Jeremy Corbyn is deeply reluctant to order strikes against British passport holders fighting for IS in Syria or elsewhere. And I'm asking you whether that's actually the behaviour that you want from a potential prime minister. Is it weak or is it actually highly principled? But before we get back to that, a couple of Brexit stories. Uh, neither of them, I think, to be honest, particularly good. The first is that Monsieur Barnier, the EU's chief negotiator, has today talked about Brexit progress having reached a very disturbing deadlock on the UK's exit bill. Um, and he said, you know, that no great steps forward have been taken. Now, I'm not sure, you know, whether we offered 20 billion, they'd probably say 40. And if we said 40 billion, I sense they'd probably say 80. I haven't been struck through any of this that he's been prepared to be reasonable. And anyway, why is there an exit bill of any kind at all? A subject we've discussed again and again on this programme. But we are completely at deadlock. Uh, David Davis is going to request that the other heads of government who meet on Thursday the 19th in Brussels uh, start to give Monsieur Barnier a different set of instructions. All I can say is that our Prime Minister, who is in a pretty weak 
difficult position right at this moment, I think, has to come back from that summit on the 19th uh, next week in Brussels, uh, showing us that we do actually have a proper strategy for going forwards. Because at the minute, not only, not only are we deadlocked, but we're running out of time in terms of our negotiations with Europe and we're squandering opportunities in America, Australia, Canada and elsewhere in the world. Although, whether we're actually up to negotiating, whether we're competent to negotiate our own set of global trade deals, uh, which I firmly believe we ought to be, and is one of the reasons why I push so hard for Brexit myself, but a bit of news today that's come out of the US uh, that is <laughs> worrying, to say the least, and it is that Liam Fox, and it's his job, of course, to get Britain ready for global trade deals, Liam Fox's delegation to the United States for trade talks uh, just the other month consisted of 27 mainly senior Whitehall officials, and they held discussions with a 77-strong US team, 20 of whom had helped negotiate and enforce trade deals around the world. Uh, Greenpeace uh, put in an information request to the UK authorities to get all of these numbers. The astonishing thing is this. The suggestion, looking at the British list of 27, is that Britain's team did not contain a single official with direct experience of negotiating trade deals. Oh dear, 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 we've got to do a bit better than this. Negotiating trade deals, getting us ready for the future, isn't just about turning up with a nice bunch of men and women and enjoying tea. It's actually about people who are capable and competent of getting down to business. So, you know, quite often, we criticise the government for not having been prepared for a no-deal scenario, uh, but in this case, we're not actually prepared to go out there and make new deals. I find that worrying and depressing. But back to Corbyn. Is he right to take this pacifist position, or do we need a leader who, against ISIS and against people who could come back to this country, uh, you know, and could do us great harm, do we need somebody a little bit tougher? Strong opinions coming in online. Derek says, why is Corbyn so upset over the death of a terrorist? She might have been British, but she was a traitor. I have no sympathy for her. It's more than likely, had she come back to the UK and been put in prison, she would have radicalised more in jail. So good riddance. So, some pretty strong views on both sides of this. Um, and I'm going to go to Ken in Harrow next. Ken, good evening. How are you doing, Nigel? Yes, I'm I doing... to speak to you. Well, today. thank you, thank you. So, what would you expect? Let You know, a couple of years' time, Corbyn's Prime Minister... Uh, what would you expect him, what would the right thing for him to do as the British Prime Minister be, in your opinion? Resign. Well, well OK. <laughs> let, let me get to the point. Okay. Corbyn, before he became the leader of the party, was actually very principled. He was, you couldn't budge him on Brexit. We, we've seen his voting record. Yes. Well, that's, I'm, I'm starting from that to make, to add and break my point. Now, he's principled, but being principled doesn't mean that someone's not going to knife you in the back, and that's the problem. He thinks being principled is going to protect society, and it won't. These people, as now, on the other end of the political spectrum, Janus Corwin Mika in the European Parliament said he would, they would slit our throats if they got the chance, and they would. We've seen videos of it. We better deal with them over there than letting them come back here. They're not going to come back here and, you know, change their way, start sipping tea and talking about the weather. And, you know, China, think about this. If China was in that position and they were threatened, how would they deal with it? They don't care that much about human rights, but this is one situation where you know they'd be more successful than us because we're too bound up by our, our emotions on these points. Fine. So, Ken, the argument is if people, have if people with British passports have decided to go down this route, they should know they're letting themselves in for being potential targets, yeah? Indeed. Having a British passport, is, you know, is something that should that should mean something to them. It's not something they can just, uh, you know, throw about like toilet paper. And that's what they've effectively done. And yeah. they, they, they're they prepared to fight against us. Keeping in mind, more Muslims have died because of ISIS, because of these people. For yeah. us to bring them back over here, put them in prison, we give them decent service, but, you know, put them up in better accommodation than they might even be receiving over there, and then put them on trial. <sighs> that's the insult. Well, well Ken... Ken, I don't think we should let any of them back. I don't want them in British prisons. I don't want them in British courts. I want their passports taken away. I don't want these people coming back here, Ken, under any circumstances. So I disagree with Corbyn's idea that we bring people like the White Widow back and put them on trial. Ken, I thank you very much indeed for your call. Uh, Rana is calling from Northampton. Good evening. 
Good evening, Nigel. Hello. Hello. So, what do you think? Well, um, obviously, the killing of a 10-year-old child is an appalling crime. And the ch- we have to remember that children are always innocent of their, uh, of their parents' mistake. I know that the lady uh, has obviously, she's breached the law. And I agree with you that I wouldn't let her inside Britain. Yep. Um, and it's true that Jer- Jeremy Corbyn's comment is unrealistic, but it's still not morally wrong, if you understand what I mean, seeing that there's a child involved. And I actually would like to also uh, um, elaborate on your former caller. Uh, indeed, he was right when he said that ISIS have killed mo- so many innocent civilians and they've ki- killed yeah. so many Muslims and yeah. there's a commitment to fight them. But please do remember as well that there are 40,000 dead civilians innocent civilians in the battle to liberate Mosul, who also died because of airstrikes, who also had nothing to do with ISIS. So, and it's not morally wrong to say that these innocent civilians' lives matter and they should be protected. Well, Ronnie, you're, 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 you're absolutely right, because... As you say, on the one hand, uh, we're concerned about the death of a 12-year-old child, but we ought to remember, and you made the point about innocent civilians, innocent civilians fleeing Raqqa, fleeing Mosul, have literally, and this is men, women and children, have literally been gunned down by ISIS as they've been doing it, thousands and thousands of them. And I suppose the morality, uh, Rana, of this is that if, unfortunately, a 12-year-old child has been killed, that is unfortunate, but it is part of an effort to take out people who've been prepared to slaughter thousands. I disagree with you on that point. I think, I think uh, because I'm an Iraqi citizen, my priority is protecting... Uh, my, my, my priority would be protecting the civilians. That's the entire priority, is, is yeah. liberating Mosul, liberating its people. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't, it shouldn't come as as a granted that we have innocent people dying. It should come as it should be seen as an outrage that we have innocent people dying. And I How just d- like to make that disagreement no, no, between no, me and no, you very no, clear. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. And can I ask you, please? You know, how do you feel now, all these years on, about the launching of the Iraq War with the specific aim of getting rid? of Saddam Hussein, because that war was about regime change. Do you look back now, over a decade on, and think it was the right decision or the wrong decision? Well, it's undoubted. It's undoubtedly clear that most of, not only me, but most of the Iraqi people think that it was a horrid, a horrible decision to send back our country 20, 30 years backwards. And, uh, of course, it would have been much better for peace, stability, and for Iraq in general if Saddam Hussein was, was... was still in power. That, 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 that's, there's no question in my mind about that. But what has already happened had happened, and we have to find our way moving forward. And currently we have three com- cities completely in ruins. Mosul is the second largest city in Iraq, and yep. it's completely in ruins. And we're going to have to rebuild that ruins. We're going to have to deal with the consequences. Uh, and, and Rana, would you, would you like to go back to Iraq if it, if it was once again a peaceful country? Well, I am a student here, and of course I'd like to... I'd like I, I, I actually think that uh, my life project would be uh, from now on is to uh, become uh, Iraqi prime minister. Right. <laughs> OK. I don't think there's anything else worth doing. <laughs> Iraq is a mess. Right. Well, we'll look out for you, Rana. If you're aiming to be the next Iraqi prime minister, we'll look out for you. I thank you for your call. And interesting, isn't it? You know, it's there an Iraqi uh, citizen saying, actually, whatever the faults were with Saddam Hussein, life actually was rather better under him than it's become since we launched that war. You're listening to The Nigel Farage Show. Yep. So, is Jeremy Corbyn right when he says he'd be really reluctant to launch drone strikes, missile strikes, that would kill UK citizens who are fighting for ISIS in Syria or elsewhere? Or is he taking a highly principled position? He thinks they should be brought back and put on trial. But Charlene says to me on Facebook, Corbyn saying that Sally Jones should be put on trial. For this to happen, we would need to send special forces to arrest her, get her out of the country she was in, bring her over here, put her on trial, and imprisoning 
her with the possibility she could radicalise other inmates. Charlene, you're right. The Corbyn proposal on this is completely impractical and would not work. He used it as an argument, I think, to try and get around the fact that there are almost no circumstances in which he would, he would sanction this happening. Indeed, he even has a problem in UK police being able to shoot to kill on our streets. I wonder what Gareth in Huddersfield makes of all of that. Good evening, Gareth. Oh, hi, Nigel. Pleasure to speak to you, and thanks for everything you've uh, done for us so far for Brexit. Um, Thank first you. First time on LBC, um, uh, you've you, you introduced me to a great station. So, um, I agree with what Charlene's saying about the, the impracticalities of, of trying to capture these people in the field. Um, it, it, the operational difficulties, I think, are ill-perceived by anybody that advocates them. Um, you know, the, the threat to our own troops or to the Peshmerga or the uh, Free Syrian Army or the Iraqi Army or whoever might be involved in, in such a capture. Um, it's just practically virtually impossible. Um, and then if you do manage to capture them and get them back into the country, the, the chances of getting information out of them, um, you know, with a slap around the face with a wet tea towel, it, it just... It, it's negligible. You'd have to use far stronger tactics, which I'm sure a snowflake like Corbyn would strongly object to. <laughs> well, I don't know. Gareth, there's a whole different debate on whether torture of any kind works or doesn't work and whether the information you get is the right stuff or the wrong stuff. Uh, but, yeah, look, you, you, know, you know, the sheer impracticality of, 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 of suggesting that somebody like her could have been brought back to the UK for interrogation, it is utter nonsense. Um, it doesn't actually work. But it was him basically covering... Gareth, he... I think he's slightly ashamed for the British public to know the extent of his pacifism. That, I think, is what that was about. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I, I, I just hope and pray daily that he never makes it to be Prime Minister of this country, because I think we've, you know... Well, well that, a, lo a lot of that will depend on Mrs May and whether she can turn things around at the European summit next week. But I do feel, Gareth, that Mrs May stays in her current weakened state. Prime Minister Corbyn becomes a much stronger possibility. Gareth, I thank you for your call. Uh, a new convert to LBC. Keep enjoying the station and thank you. Uh, Nigel Farage, sanctioning the killing of a 12-year-old child is disgraceful by any standards. Well, they weren't sanctioning the killing of a 12-year-old child. The 12-year-old child was killed as collateral damage. And I'm sorry, it's horrible, it's awful, but it's what happens, I'm afraid, in any kind of war, which is why the decision to go to war is such a fundamentally important one that should only be taken if governments are, and, and parliaments indeed, are absolutely certain that they know what they're setting out to achieve. And I think... In the case of Iraq, you know, we didn't really know, and it was fascinating before the break to have an Iraqi citizen on saying, whatever you think of Saddam Hussein, things were better then than they are now. John, in Glasgow, how do you rate Corbyn's ability to lead the country and to make very difficult decisions? Well, I don't think it's much better than Theresa May's. I wouldn't condemn him any more than I would Theresa May or... Uh or David Cameron. It's all gutless stuff, which isn't, up, which isn't uh, confronting the issues up front. We have state, the state condemning and executing people without due process. What yep. they should be doing is, is they, they have the Treason Act on the statute book. It used to be a treachery act, which was repealed. They need to have due process. They need to uh, convict these people in the absentia if necessary, or if they want to come back and, and answer the charges, fine. But convict them properly. And then if they want to kill them, that's fine. It's, it's then correct, it's proper, but there is no death penalty in this country. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's double standards. They just need to convict them properly. We had treason acts, we had treachery acts. Lord Haw Haw was the last time anybody was actually executed for this. Well, it's too long ago. And they do, all they have to do is yeah. have a real problem with the government not following due process. They can, they, can, they, can, they can do away with a huge amount of the bureaucracy involved simplify the procedures but they need to bring the statutes back out of the cupboards dust them off amend them as necessary and implement them and then that's fine yeah john for those that don't know lord haw haw of course was a radio broadcaster wasn't he um, he was <laughs> <laughs> he was a, he was a a british um a a british traitor um, i wouldn't wish that fate on you nigel <laughs> <laughs> no, but just because people don't always know these things and he was broadcasting back into the united kingdom from occupied europe under the call sign germany calling uh, saying that terrible things would happen to the uk if we went on fighting that nice mr hitler and in the end uh, he was 
was arrested as the Allies advanced, and he was shot in the Tower of London, wasn't he, in 1945, executed there. But, of course, John, we can't execute anybody in the United Kingdom. Do you know why? Do you know the big legal reason why we couldn't execute anybody, even if the government wanted to? Probably the European Court of Human Rights. It's against the European Convention on Human Rights, and European Union members have to be signed up to it, so we couldn't do it anyway. I'm not suggesting we should, but we couldn't do it anyway. But what worries you then, John, about what's been happening, and, and, and Cameron did it and defended himself very vigorously back in September 2015, you feel there's a lack of due process here, yeah? Well, well, the, this country has always worked on due process. Whether the process is perfect is another matter, but they need to, it's gutless what they're doing. They're allowing foreign powers to go off killing British citizens. Whether they're bad guys or not, that is wrong they need to they need to do it properly follow the due process get the correct statutes uh, and we're supposed to believe in the european union so we can start the necessary process and it would also assist with these people coming back from there back into the country uh, because we have to let them in because they're british citizens because of our uh, form of uh, john, our citizens. john i don't want to let any of them back in i want to take their passports from them and ban them from, co from coming back to our country would you accuse me in wanting to do that of not acting with due process? No, but the problem in this country is is that uh, we need to, if we have these people properly, uh, uh, by whatever process we have, convicted of treachery or treason or whatever, whether they've got a passport or not is then irrelevant. Uh, but we have this situation where uh, somebody happens to be born in this country is automatically a British citizen. Many other countries in Europe, including Germany, I hasten to add, just because yeah. you're born in the country, it doesn't mean you say you're a German citizen. So this argument about the person being born in Germany and having a German passport and we have to allow them back doesn't apply. OK. No, John, listen, thank you very much indeed. Um, my only reaction I get on Twitter is, why did it take so long? Some of you really quite pleased that the news that the White Widow is dead. Uzma is calling from Preston. Good evening, Uzma. Good evening, Nigel. Hi. So, is Corbyn the right kind of guy to lead the country if he's not prepared to launch strikes like this, or would he actually bring a new type of principled politics to the West? I think he has got his principles, and I think we can't deny that. He, he stood by them for a long time, hasn't he? But yeah. I think in the case of the Islamic State, um, particularly, she, she was an adult when she left this country. She made a choice. She very, very, very sad that her little boy was taken and he was corrupted into her belief. But I actually think that if you choose to go to war, which that's what the Islamic State say they are doing, then the consequence of war is that you will end like this. And I, I actually don't think we should give them the time to come back here and sort of give their twisted version of Islam and give them a further voice through court cases and the newspapers and the media. I just think she made a choice and, and, and that's what happens when you go to war. She made a choice and she paid the price for it, but it's sad that a 12-year-old kid has paid the price too. Because he was a little boy and yes. he had no choice in the matter. And that is sad that if a little boy has died. But yeah. at the end of the day, that woman was dangerous. She's killed so many other people's parents and children and whatever. And yeah. um, the, the sick message, she deserved to yeah. go like that. And, and that's a horrible thing to say, probably. No, Osma, I, 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 listen, I, I, you know, uh, you've come on the radio, you've come on LBC and said it. Uh, I suspect, I suspect a lot of people are nodding along with you. I thank you for your call. Uh, my thoughts on this are... I don't want any of these people coming back into our country under any circumstances. And I think Uzma, our last caller from Preston, actually was on the money. If they've made the decision to go off and fight with this barbarous outfit, they have to accept the consequences. Going to war means the risk of getting killed. It's desperately sad that a 12-year-old kid was involved, but I'm very, very pleased that Sally Jones won't be coming back to this country, I must say. You've been listening to The Nigel Farage Show.